Uh, hello, I'm Edith Wojska. I'm a PhD student and actually an aerobiologist. And I'm going to tell about our research on computational modeling of animals' behavior. Sorry, I tried. <laughs> Better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, for a technical note, the presentation is available in um, this, via this link. And I'm going to tell about the research on the cognitive process of reinforcement learning, which is based, which basically serves the purpose of adapting to the uh, environment that is uncertain. And um, in exact um, about um, the component of time, so the time influence on the process. Um, for the sake, we use the Q-learning algorithms for the uh, reinforcement learning branch of machine learning, but only simple one with uh, further modifications. And I must admit, we have a quite well suited behavioral setting uh, for this purpose. So probably I should start with telling what the reinforcement learning is. So it's basically, as I said, serve the purpose of adapting to the uh, environment that is uncertain. And as a ground rule, um, is this made by the certain um, iterative inter interaction with the environment of the agent? So basically, the situation looks that an agent, for us it's a mouse, uh, performs a decision, then um, so chooses, actually chooses between options and gets the outcome of the decision. And the outcome may be in form of um, accessing a reward, accessing access to the reward or the access being denied. And as a reward, we use um, water with artificial sweetener with um, saccharin. So basically the reinforcer is um, sweet taste. And what's important, after many and many trials, an animal begins to have um, um, certain expectation towards each of the option. It's uh, denoted as Q value, but I will go to it further. And for the um, agent, I'll, for the mice, I will refer to uh, it as she because I found it much more distinctive and easier to use. So most of our experiments are performed in the intake cage, as the previous speaker uh, said, which is basically a big plastic box with four chambers, located, each of them located in different um, corners of the cage. And we put 14 female mice inside it, set the procedure on and know the, all the actions an animal performs. And um, the drink, um, the beverages are stored in the bottles and for a mouse, it means that um, as to access it, she must first visit um, the corner, then the inner door must get opened, and only then and only then she can actually get uh, access the bottle, and then she can leak the bottom of the the bottom of the bottle. The catch is the door might get open or not with a given chance. So we set it as a probability according to the experimental scheme which consists of two stages, adaptation and reversals. And for the adaptation stage, it's only important to know that the position of um, bottles with um, rewarding beverage changes its position from one state to another, so we have the reversals. And for the main test phase, um, the position does not change but the probability um, does. So in a state when we have 90% probability and 30, after 30, 38 hours, uh, the state would be reversed to the exact contrary. So from 90 and 30, it would be 30 and 90. And what, that's why it is, refer, it is termed as uh, reversal learning and with probabilistic outcome because the chances to access the word are set with a given probability. Now, in a point of view of an animal, it means that she basically has an option between, uh, she has a choice between one option and the other. And uh, because we keep the um, water corners outside of the modeling part. And then uh, I will present the Q learning basic, like most basic algorithm. So it would like that. 
a mouse chooses between options, let's say A and B, and she has given expectation toward this option. This expectation can be said, it's like, how, like you, how likely would you um, be to go for this option? So how, um, in scale of zero to one, how do you think this option would be beneficial in the future? So, if the uh, choice gets rewarded, the, uh, the estimate should rise, whereas it's not rewarded, it should drop down. And the increase and decrease is denoted by, um, is um, in relation to prediction error, which is basically and intuitively um, just difference between the real outcome and the expecta expected one. And the uh, outcome is binary, so there is access to reward or there's none. And also we have in here, for, so for the next iteration, for the next choice, the ex expectation changes. And for this we use, um, yeah, it's, it's in uh, iteration. So there is a, uh, one free parameter, um, which is called the running rate, which denotes the weight put on the current choice. So the greater the value, the more information is transferred from the current choice is transferred to the next one. So, if it's uh, like almost one, it means that the only the current choice would matter for the expectation for the next ones. And the second step of, um, of it is to tell probability of each, each option to be taken. So, for this sake, uh, we use softmax function and we feed it with the um, value of expectation of the chosen option and the no chosen option. And as you can see uh, in here, um, it also has the free parameter, which is called beta. And as, you, as the shape of the function changes, changes <laughs> um, uh, with the greater uh, the, sh the shape of the curve gets uh, more shaper with a uh, um, greater value of the beta. And it's important because um, the value actually denotes how um, I mean, if um, the difference in between expectations toward one option and another will be small, if it goes sharply, um, it, the difference would be spotted. Whereas it's almost horizontal, it, it would be like not, unnoticeable. And um, what should I say in here? Real science invokes in challenge, so that's the problem we are faced with. So uh, for a typical experimental setup, for example, a patient performs a series of crew reaction, uh, crew, crew reaction um, task with a restricted um, reaction time. But in our experiment, the animals are free to make their, make their choices whenever they like. And the experiment also lasts like for about a month, like without any break. So we can see that the frequency of intervals between choices it is way more um, spread out with the peak something around 10 minutes. So it takes, basically it means that uh, it takes minutes for an animal to perform a choice. And now um, I'll tell about our two ideas of how to explain it. And first one is quite um, to explain the influence of on time on decision making, sorry. Um, uh, what doesn't matter. So the first idea is pretty intuitive because Animals just do forget along with time, right? So I thought the expected rewards should also decay with time. And I searched the World Wide Web, like from right to left, and I found some um, mathematical uh, attempts to describe the um, decay, but no hard evidence in data. So there are, there are only theoretical considerations in this issue. But in the deep void of the internet, I found this uh, publication, sorry. And um, it has exactly this function, along with another theoretical considerations. And I found it useful, so I applied. Um, so after calculating the expectation towards its option, we just decay it along with the time that passed between the choices. And the uh, time is um, distinct from chosen and non-chosen option, because like, the time passing by the way between um, decision A and decision B would be, would be different. And again, this, is a, this has a free parameter of storage and 
if the value is high, because it's range from 0 to 1, it would mean that the um, decay of the expectation would be short. Whereas if it's small, it means like almost linear and uh, really slow. The another expectation, uh, the another explanation would, um, would be quite intuitive for anybody in um, rodents research. So we found in the data that mice um, tend to repeat the last choice at longer intervals. So if there is a really long interval between choices, probably a mice don't, uh, doesn't know what to do. So she just chooses the last known option. And we also try to include it into the modeling strategy. So after having um, probability with the self-mox function, mm -hmm. we um, calculate um, add another coefficient, uh, which is a log of odds ratio for the, um, for the uh, action to be um, performed, which is basically a starting point in this. B and there's also a free parameter of Yota, and along with the parameter, as you can see, the x the probability of a given option to be performed rises along with time. Uh, yeah. uh, if the value is um, high, it means that the speed, uh, the rise would be um, quicker. And the natural step now is to, to would be to tell um, which model best fits the data or what's the exact explanation. And obviously, the absolute estimate is not reachable because it's modeling. Um, but we can surely tell that um, um, simulation on to totally random, um, random choosing is out of the question, whereas models including time components um, all uh, perform the basic uh, algorithm. And the measure in here is um, ACAIC, so ACAIC information criterion, which is quite useful for rough comparison. But um, also already suboptimal for our needs because as you can see, it's the sum of negative logarithm of probability of the chosen options. So if it's the sum, it strongly depends on the number of choices, which is, and you can see it in here, quite, there is quite a lot of within group viability. So the Ike value for this, let's call it lazy animal would be like 300 and for this, like his super active sister would be like 80 hundreds. Um, yeah, and the second step would be to tell, um, the, to um, assess quality of a model would be to tell um, its parameter values, whether they are in reasonable ranges, and, uh, and then to tell what they mean. And um, it's m way more useful when comparing between groups, so between um, experimental conditions, for example. But um, I will, so I will go briefly uh, uh, over it and only tell that the, for the storage model, the decay uh, value for, for the decay model, the storage um, parameter is quite on its floor. It means that the forgetting would be really slow. And for the Yota parameter, it's, um, it's the note that um, there would be like really influence on it. And as you can see, we do not conduct statistics on a whole group because there's a huge vivian group viability, so it does represents one animal, and the line, and the line connects uh, this dot. So we have a measure for um, fit to the data and also for parameters for each single animal super individually. And um, what I want to, you to remember is that we have a quite well-suited behavioral test. Um, and also we find that the interval between choices influence the decision making and we um, tell our two ideas of how to explain this influence. First was slow decay of expectation with time, so the decay model, and the second one was repeating the, the um, last choice, coupled with the uh, increase of the probability of um, given action to be performed with uh, longer intervals. Because we found that the mice tend to repeat the last trace at longer intervals. And I know this model seems uh, in contrary, um, but for me, they are quite, they seem much more complementary. Because I think the ultimate so the explanation for this would be that the expectation probability just rises at the beginning, 
um, because of the consolidation process, so the storing uh, of memory, then forgets slowly, and then when it reaches some indifference point, then the animal should probably go for the last known option. And that's it for the presentation. I want to thank people from my um, institute, Łukasz Szumic, Zofia Harda, and Jan Rodriguez Parakitna, who's here. And um, for code and data, please feel welcome to visit my GitHub account. That's the direct link to check out our last publication. Uh, yeah, a like preprint is available. So I'd like to thank you for this talk. <laughs> and please do have questions. Uh, so, so yeah, so I, I think that uh, automation will be a very important process. Uh, like a few weeks ago, I've seen a um, talk by, so I forgot his name, the person from uh, Princeton who looks at the decision making in rats and he basically completely automatized the whole process. So the, the rats are trained to be in the cages where they are pre presented with stimuli. Um, he recalls from hundreds of neurons at the same time, and he has 100 cages which are in his lab with hundreds of rats doing this task. Yes? And I think he, in this way, uh, he can, um, oh, Carlos Brode, this is his name, yes. So in this way, he can uh, get an enormous amount of data. And of course, he then uses automated tools to analyze this. So I, I think this is a really important direction in which this, this will go. Further comments from the speaker, some of you from the audience? So, have you guys thought about performing this behavior experiment in the open source uh, acquisition box? Because the IntelliJ, I believe, is a fairly expensive system, and uh, not many people can afford to buy it. And there has been some open source kind of like types of behavior design where people can get pla like plastic glass, and then they can really build things from scratch. And there is like kind of like some design release from you know like few groups. Have you guys thought about using that platform? So then everybody will be complete open source. Uh, well, uh, there is a, a system uh, called uh, EcoHub, which was uh, developed uh, by my colleague uh, in our institute. Uh, and uh, uh, if I remember, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, presented uh, 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 as kind of uh, open hardware. And also, uh, my colleague uh, uh, develops, uh, uh, my other colleague, uh, develops a uh, uh, similar uh, library as PyMice uh, to uh, help uh, analyze data from this system. Uh, so uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, that may be uh, uh, an example uh, of uh, what you are uh, asking about. More comments? Yeah, I think that if you have, I have it still, so it's okay. So I think we have um, all the information needed for the modeling part it could be performed whenever the um, setting, uh, the experimental setting. You know, we need information about the uh, choices visits set it probabilistically and uh, yeah, about time of it. I wanted to comment actually. The main difficulty is the technical reliability. The IntelliJ cages are not fun to work with and they are a standardized product with 10 years of engineering experience. Any open source solution, if someone wants to assemble it and then run 10 cages in parallel, I really want to see how many failures of equipment per day they have and how they can somehow account for this in the data later on. So it becomes then a problem of being technically able to perform the experiment and the analysis really becomes a secondary issue. And I think this is the main limitation. And this is not be solved simply by open source unless there is a great focus on one solution which is extremely simple and widely used, which with open source is never likely. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for the talks again. One issue regarding the modeling of your behavioral data, how do you make sure that your models are identifiable? I mean, how do you account that the solution after you fit your model to your empirical data, and the parameters you obtain, how do you make sure that these are the, ne the unique ones, that not some other type of parameter combination would lead the same um, result in your, in your data? Yeah, so this is a very important question. Um, for the simple models which I presented, like the diffusion model, you can um, see the identifiability for, because of the arguments um, that they have the, the parameters have different effect on the different um, features. Um, but of course, uh, to have this identifiability, you also have to have sufficient amount of data. Yes? And you can assess this identifiability through parameter recovery procedure. 
So uh, what you do, you simulate a model uh, with certain parameters, with a certain number of trials, and then you um, estimate the parameters. You repeat this hundreds of times, and then you get a measure of how far your parameters are from the true values in the ground true on average. Yes. And um, so, so this is how, how you kind of can do this. Uh, as I mentioned, this becomes more difficult when you have more difficult models with more difficult parameters. So for example, there was a question here you know, about introducing like uh, correlation into, no into noise. The more parameters we introduce... Oh, I was asking about something else. Okay. How you detect that your noise is uncorrelated? Um, okay, so, but, but the more parameters you introduce, the, the more difficult it is to, to um, recover them. One interesting thing is that you know, uh, with the reinforcement learning parameters, you have these two parameters, mm -hmm. alpha and beta. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you can also uh, try to uh, re use this model recovery to see how, f how well you um, recover them. But um, you can improve this recovery by linking the reinforcement learning models with diffusion model. So in the diffusion model, um, the way you link them, you assume that the drift rate is equal to the difference between Q values on the two trials. And um, there's a paper by Sam, um, Samuel McClure which shows that by adding reaction times to the, um, to the diffusion model and using this combined diffusion model with reinforcement learning, you can actually reduce the errors on the estimate of this alpha and beta parameters. 